Well, good evening. Oh, no. We have to do better than that. Good evening. All right. It is good to be here. I uh, just finished a, a, a trip where I left here and ended up in Atlanta and preaching there for a couple of days and then in Houston for a couple more days and Detroit for a couple of days, back to Houston, then to Charlotte, finished in Charlotte, flew to London, left on a Monday, got there Tuesday, preached one place Tuesday night, one place Wednesday night, the conference Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, left on Monday, got here on Tuesday, and the movers arrived yesterday. <laughs> yes. So we talked about this a long time before this sudden move came up. Um, and I had already had this sort of on the calendar and was thinking about it. And when Bridget saw it, to be honest, with all the things that were happening, I'd kind of put it away in the back of my mind. And she said, why would you schedule this during this time? I said, I, I didn't. I scheduled it and then this time. So pray for us. But this is actually a very nice break in the middle of having boxes all over the house and uh, shifting from one place to another. Listen, I love the 1689. I, I love confessionalism in general, but I love our confession. And just to give you a, a little background and kind of why um, I was asked to do this, at uh, our church in Houston that we planted in 2006, the one I came here from, um, for the last three years, um, we had made a 10-week course on the 1689 a prerequisite for entering our membership course. Yeah. So you had to do a 10-week course on the 1689 before you could enter the new members course. And I taught this course, this 10-week course, three times a year. So I've, I've done this a number of times and uh, have really grown to love the confession more and more as I've done this. The reason that we started doing that was we had our, these small groups that would meet in the evenings. And um, at one point, I led a small group through Sam Waldron's book, A Modern Exposition of the 1689. And after leading the first group of people through that, I don't remember how many families we had in that small group, let's say five or six families in that, that group that met, they said, everybody in the church ought to go through this. Everybody. So a few months later, led it again. And this group, after going through the say, ah, everybody in the church, everybody should go through this. So being the great leader that I am, <laughs> went back to my fellow elders and I said, you know what, maybe everybody should go through this. And we did. So I'm very excited that all the groups are now going to be going through the confession. Before we go through it, let me just give you an example of one of the things that I face on a regular basis. You know, ACU is a confessional school. And so people who come and teach at ACU subscribe to our confession. And here's a gentleman, people have often asked, you know, that about the delay with starting the seminary. And part of that is we have to have enough theology faculty to teach at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And our theology faculty has to fully subscribe to the 1689. And, and here's a letter that I got from one gentleman who he's willing to come to Zambia, willing to come and be a part of our work here. I'm a graduate of a very prominent Baptist seminary in the US and currently serve as an elder at a church in, uh, on the East Coast in the US. That church holds to the New Hampshire Confession, which is a, a cousin of the 1689. I could subscribe to at least 95% of the Second London Confession, but there are a few issues to which I would take exception. Those areas are detailed below. Problem number one, chapter 22, paragraph seven and eight, problem number two, chapter 26, paragraph four, problem number three, chapter 30, paragraph three, problem number four, chapter 26, paragraph nine, problem number five, chapter 26, paragraph 10, and the final problem, chapter 30, paragraph three. Other than that though, 
He's with us, right? It's like, I love you. But if I could just take that right hand off and maybe the left knee and perhaps six ribs from this side and maybe an ear over there, yes. Yes, I'll take you. You see, our confession works together as a whole. And it's very important for us to understand that. 1689 Federalism is not just a sort of haphazard collection of ideas, but it is actually a confession that is built to hold and work together. And that's what I want us to look at on this evening, how the confession is meant to build, uh, how the confession is meant to, to hold together and to be taken as a whole. When we think about our confession, we have to put it in a historical context. And that historical context is 17th century Baptist life. And when we read the confession, we have to read it in the context of 17th century Baptist life. We have to read the words that they choose to use in light of the fact that they were written by 17th century Baptist. We have to understand the historical context and the historical setting in order for us to be able to appreciate the confession and to appreciate what the confession is trying to communicate. There are a number of ways that we can read the Bible. And there are a number of ways that people do read the Bible. Uh, Jim Renahan, who is probably, uh, I would argue, the foremost authority, uh, living authority on the Second London Baptist Confession. Uh, Dr. Renahan has taught for many years at the Institute for Reformed Baptist Studies, which was at, housed at Westminster Seminary in uh, Escondido, in this San Diego area. That is a Presbyterian seminary. But within that Presbyterian seminary, there was this Institute for Reformed Baptist Studies. And students could go to Westminster, study at... Uh, IRBS and get a Westminster degree, but basically having studied 1689 instead of Second London um, in, in, their, in their framework, um, more than just the confessional courses. But that is now moving, and there will be a standalone uh, Reformed Baptist Seminary in Dallas. Uh, well, Dr. Renahan was the, the bulwark for IRBS, and he, he in talking about the confession, talks about the number of ways that we can read scripture. One way that we can read scripture is we can read scripture um, historically. And reading scripture historically is going to the text, trying to understand what happened and when it happened, trying to put things in historical order. Um, maybe even looking at the overall plan of redemption. But that's, that's one way that we can approach the scriptures. And, and you can approach the scriptures this way as a Christian or as a non-Christian. You know, as a new believer, um, I was a student at a secular university in the U.S. when God called me to preach. I, I never heard the gospel. Again, you know, I've told you this before, until my first year in university. And, I, you know, I, I am following the Lord and you know, have this call to preach and want to begin to study. So I take courses at the secular, secular university that I was attending. And I took a course on um, the gospel of Mark from a professor, Dr. Werner Kelber. Dr. Kelber was considered one of the foremost authorities in the world on the gospel of Mark. I mean, this man knew the gospel of Mark like the back of his hand. He knew the Gospel of Mark inside and out. I, I mean, he just, you know, you would say something about a section in Mark, and he would go, yes, that's this verse, that verse, and, you know, uh, you know, this Greek manuscript has this reading of it, and this Greek manuscript has that reading. I mean, he, that level of knowledge of the Gospel of Mark. The man was not a Christian. He was not a Christian. But he was an expert in reading the Gospel of Mark from an historical perspective, right? So you can do that as a believer or a non-believer. Secondly, 
You can read the Bible from an ethical perspective. It, that, that's reading the Bible not for what happened and when, and not trying to get it in, in uh, its historical context, but you can read the Bible trying to find out what's right and what's wrong. What, what is expected of me? What is required of me? That's an ethical reading of the text. And there are a lot of people who read the scriptures that way, Christians and non-Christians. There are a lot of people who think they're Christians who read the scriptures this way. In fact, one of the marks of a false professor is that they only read the scriptures this way, as an ethical text. They're, they're, you have to tick the right boxes. Salvation is about ticking the right boxes. And so I've got to find out where the boxes are. Really, I've also got to find out where the loopholes are. Amen? How much ungodliness can I enjoy and still tick the box? Okay? Um, that, that is the way you can read the scriptures. And again, believer, non-believer, you can read the scripture this way. As believers, you can read the scriptures this way. A third way is a theological framework. We read the Bible theologically. And our goal is to understand what it is that God says about himself and about us being made in his image. What is God saying about himself? Ways of reading are appropriate. All three ways of reading are appropriate. But this third way informs the other. So your theological understanding of who God is is going to inform your historical reading of the text. Amen? Kelber would have one understanding of the history of the Bible. I would have another. All right? Because of a theological framework. Your theological framework is also going to understand your ethical reading of the text. Right? So when we're going to the Bible and trying to understand uh, what it's teaching us from an ethical perspective, uh, our theological framework is going to inform that. When we talk about confessions, we are talking about reading the Bible from a theological framework. We are trying to ascertain what the Bible is saying about God and about us. We're trying to bring all these things together from the totality of Scripture so that we understand the, the most important things that God says about himself and about us. Now, when we talk about confessions, there are some wonderful benefits to confessions. They unite believers. Um, they distinguish Protestants from Rome. They distinguish Protestants from one another. They, confessions have origins actually in the New Testament. Um, and they're essential disciple-making tools. So let, let's look at these before we move into it. When we talk about the New Testament and confessions, and the, the New Testament being confessional, it's important to understand that there are uh, confessional statements in the, in the New Testament. These statements that sort of give rise to and give us the idea that it's important to confess certain things. And verse uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What you have heard from me in the presence of faithful witness, witnesses. Earlier on, he kind of clarifies that. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So Paul is not saying to Timothy, you, you need to remember and hold in your mind or even to an equal degree everything that you've ever heard from me. That wasn't the case. There was a pattern of sound words. There was a foundation. There was a basis. There was a root, if you will. And confessionalism is about this root. People say, well, I believe the Bible. Folks, the Bible is a big book. Amen? And there are people all over the place who say that Jehovah's Witnesses say they believe the Bible. Mormons say they believe the Bible. Right? Even Muslims will say that they believe the Bible if read and interpreted appropriately. So saying that you believe the Bible 
doesn't really get us anywhere, okay? We've got to be a little more specific than that. What do you even mean when you say Bible? So if I start listing off the Apocrypha, are you going to say, well, you know, let's go to Maccabees. Well, wait a minute. No, I don't. No, nah, Maccabees, I'm not. Well, you said the Bible. Well, no, I don't believe that's Bible. Ah, guess what? You're waxing confessional now. Because now you're saying, here's what I mean when I say Bible. Do you follow me? So I, I know that there are a lot of us out there who want to just be able to say, you know, I, the Bible. No confession but the Bible. The Bible's really big and heretics believe it. Right? Heretics will grab that Bible and point different verses and rip them out of context. So that's not enough. We've got to be the Roman Catholics have, have apocryphal books in their Bible. Are we going to say that's Bible? No. So confessionally, we've got to be clear there. Ah, no creed but Christ. Amen. Now you just let the Mormons in and the Jehovah's Witnesses in. Our only creed is Christ. Because a Mormon could say amen to that. A Jehovah's Witness could say amen to that. Huh? Somebody who's involved in the most cultic versions of seven-day Adventism could say amen to that. No creed but Christ. Well, then you have to go, well, no, <laughs> because they believe in a different Jesus than we do. Really? Now you're waxing confessional again. Because now you're saying, when I say Jesus, what I mean is dot, dot, dot. Do you see? So, I mean, people, people like to sound pious, you know, as though they're above it all. No creed but Christ. You simpletons might need confessions, but not me. I have Jesus. Really, same Jesus as Jehovah's Witnesses? No. My Jesus, dot, dot, dot. Ah, you just got confessional. You said no creed but Christ. If you really believe that, then I would say, okay, how about the Jehovah's Witnesses? And you would go, no creed but Christ. Because that's your only creed. You can't give me another answer. Do you see the problem? We've got to be more specific than that. All right. 2 Timothy 3.14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. There are a number of places where we have um, short uh, creedal statements. Um, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Right? And what we have following is a short creedal statement. And many of the early creeds and confessions are based on these creedal statements. Now, when we talk about confessions, let me give you a little brief history of confessions. We've, we just came out of, a couple of days ago, uh, Reformation Day, right? 500th Reformation Day. Or did you have Halloween? Right? Reformation Day, October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago. That was 1517. The Augsburg Confession, which is the Lutheran Confession, was written in 1530. And that's just 13 years later that we get the Augsburg Confession. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. The Augsburg Confession is a Lutheran Confession. Lutheranism is not Reformed. So the Augsburg Confession is not a Reformed Confession. Even though Luther was credited with starting the Reformation. You, you'll understand it tomorrow. No? We'll talk about that when we get into our confession. Lutheran doctrine and Reformed doctrine, um, not the same on a number of accounts. Um, but Protestantism comes out of this same stream. So the Augsburg Confession is important in that regard. The Belgic Confession, 1561. The 39 Articles. Anybody know whose confession that is? Nope. Anglicans. Church of England. Okay. Church of England is so far gone, it's not even funny. 
some of the greatest heretics in the church today are Church of England. If you read the 39 articles, you'll ask yourself how they even got in. They're embarrassed by the 39 articles, okay? Because they don't, they don't hold to that orthodox confession. Uh, that's 1571. The canons of the Synod of Dort, that was 1619. So now we're entering the 17th century. The First London Baptist Confession, 1644. The Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646. Here's why that's important. That's important because oftentimes, because the 1689 is written um, along the same pattern as the Westminster Confession, a lot of people assume that the 1689 is just a copy of Westminster with some Baptist ideas added to it. But Westminster Confession, what year? 1646, right? First London Confession, what year? 1644. Folks, there was a Reformed Baptist Confession before there was a Presbyterian Confession. Huh? Ours, ours came first, all right? Now the 1689, well, let me move on. After the Westminster, you have the Savoy Declaration of Faith and Order. That's 1685. Um, Savoy is the confession of uh, the Congregationalist Puritans, okay? Chief among them is John Owen. Now, the Savoy Declaration was patterned after the Westminster Confession. And the 1689 was patterned after Savoy following Westminster. There's a reason for that. This was not about copying each other. At this point, what is happening is reformed doctrine is sort of, be, it's being, not sort of, it's being synthesized, all right? You see where we come down this historical corridor. There are also a couple of things happening. There, there's violent, um, and, and I mean violent persecution of Protestants, especially in England. They don't call her Bloody Mary for nothing, right? But there, there's violent persecution in, in England. If you're one group, another group, so on and so forth, depending on who's on the throne. So for Westminster, 1646, Savoy, 1685, and Second London, 1689, to all be written based on the same outline is actually an idea of showing a united front among reformed Protestants. It also made it easier to see the areas where the groups differed, where they did not agree because they were written along the same format. So you didn't have to go, well, over here, they had that in this part of the confession and over here they had that. No, it was written on the same format so that there could be this kind of clarity. And also in the development of the, the presentation of theology itself, this format, if you look at this format and you look at the way systematic theologies are written, modern systematic theologies, they follow this similar format. So what are the sources of our confession? You just kind of heard uh, one, the first London Baptist Confession of 1644. Um, Two, the Westminster Confession, 1646, 47. Three, the Savoy Declaration of Faith and Order of 1685. And four, the labors of Elder William Collins and other contributors to the 1677 general meeting. So sometimes you'll see on our confession, 1677 slash 89, this process started at that general meeting in 1677 and ultimately comes to fruition and is accepted in a general meeting in 1689, okay?
Um, but it's not the confession of 1677, it's the confession of 1689. And it's important to note that because the Savoy Declaration was very influential. The Congregational Puritans were very, inf were, were very influential. John Owen was very influential. Interestingly enough, John Owen, some of the strongest arguments for pedo-baptism that you're going to find are arguments from John Owen. But John Owen, uh, for uh, credo baptism, I'm sorry, for uh, John Owen was a credo baptist. Those congregational Puritans, they were credo baptists. They baptized infants. But theologically, I mean, John Owen is running in that direction, but he doesn't get there. The Baptists are there. The Baptists were there since 1609. That was the first Baptist church. It was in Amsterdam, 1609. So when there was a disagreement, it was usually tracking with Savoy as opposed to tracking with Westminster. So those are the sources of our confession. Um, here's what that does not mean. That does not mean that basically our confession was just a compiling of these things. Understand what's happening since 1530, even before 1530. We have the earliest creeds of the church, right? The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Creed of Chalcedon. We have all of these creeds. And these creeds become more robust. And these creeds build upon each other as they become more robust. And as new heresies raise their heads, the creeds sort of expand in order to speak to the particular heresies of the day. Well, when you read these confessions, what each of these confessions is doing is reaching back to that creedal heritage that all Christians hold in common, okay? So nobody was trying to invent the wheel nor did anyone need to. All of these groups were trying to do the same thing. Basically say, here is what we believe the scriptures to teach. And here is the historical line that we come from. This is not new. We did not make this up. This goes from the Bible to us through faithful men throughout church history. Amen? That's very important, especially today. Because the spirit of the age is the spirit of contemporaneity. It's just a fancy word that means newer must be better. Right? That's what I was just, I told you, I was just back in the States. And um, my phone, my screen had cracked. And it was bad. And I went to, you know, a place to get it fixed. And it, oh, it was going to be so expensive to get it fixed. I was like, ah, you know, I got a trip coming up. I'll just go back, you know, and I'll get it fixed when I'm there. And it got bad. Last few days, pieces started to crumble off. Like, it's so bad. But I waited. I held out. I got there. I got my screen fixed. And, you know, you walk into the Apple store. And right now, it's just, I mean, in one of the stores, on the malls in London, there was a line outside the Apple store. Apple store is full on the inside. It's a line outside the Apple store. Why? Because there's a new iPhone. In fact, there's two. There's iPhone 8 and iPhone X. And everybody's rushing in to get the newest and latest. And if you were to stand in line and ask them, well, what exactly does the new iPhone have that the old one doesn't? They look at you and say, like, what are you talking about? It's the new one. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, what exactly are the improvements that were made in this one that would justify you spending the amount of money that you're about to spend to go buy a new one? What? <laughs> it's the new one. Where have you been? It's newer. It must be better. Well, people, the people who are going to be in these groups studying this material are going to be people who live in that world. Amen? And if you live in the world of newer is better and somebody says, let's open the 1689, 
<laughs> that could be a little difficult to grasp, all right? All right, let's, let's move ahead here um, for, the sake of, for the sake of time. Um, let's look at confessions and disciple making. And this is an important idea. This comes from the preamble to our confession. Listen to what they said. And remember, this is 1689. And verily there is one spring and cause of the decay of religion in our day, which we cannot but touch upon and earnestly urge a redress of, and that is the neglect of, worship of, uh, neglect of the worship of God in families by those whom the charge and conduct of them is commanded. May not the gross ignorance and instability of many with the profaneness of others be justly charged upon their parents and masters who have not trained them up in the way wherein they ought to walk when they were young? but have neglected those frequent and solemn commandments which the Lord hath laid upon them so to catechize and instruct them that their tender years might be seasoned with the knowledge of the truth of God as revealed in the scriptures. So saying, this is an important discipleship tool. When we talk about discipleship, we're usually not thinking about confessions. Um, give people an assurance of salvation, teach them to have a quiet time, show them how to evangelize, show them how to discover their spiritual gifts, send them on their way, right? And, and we say, discipleship achieved. And, and they know little or nothing from a theological perspective. Confessions standardize the content of discipleship. That's number one. They standardize the content of discipleship. What do people need to know? What do people need to know? Well, our Baptist forefathers believed that the confession was a concise answer to that question. And we say, ah, that's not concise. Ah, uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Have you seen a systematic theology? Seen, I wish I brought Burkhoff's systematic theology in here, right? Uh, confessions are very concise compared to that, all right? Um, and it also fills in the gaps. It fills in the gaps. There are things that we just would not teach, that we would not talk about, were it not for our confessions. I'll give you an example. It's a little risky here. You know, they say lawyers are not supposed to ask questions in court unless they know the answer. Well, I'm not in court, so I don't know the answer. But if we were to say together the, the, the order salutis or the, the order of salvation, right? What would we say? For most of us, it would be, starts with a J, justification, and then, huh? Don't be looking at the confession. What would we say? We would say sanctification, and then we say glorification, right? I mean, you hear somebody talk about salvation, the order of salutis, that's what you're going to hear. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. You read the confession, it's justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification. We, we've just completely lost the doctrine of adoption, which is incredibly important, right? Justification says I've been declared righteous. Sanctification says God's making me righteous. Glorification says one day I'm going to be completely righteous, right? That's good. I have been forgiven from the penalty of sin, right? I am being cleansed from the presence and power of sin. One day I will be delivered completely from sin. That's awesome. That's good stuff. But guess what adoption says? I have been declared righteous. I have been made God's child as much as Jesus is God's child because I'm found in him. 
I'm being conformed to the image of Christ because I've been adopted into the family of God as his son or daughter. And I will be glorified because God is going to save his child whom he adopted. Now, how many times do we talk to people who are struggling with their salvation, struggling with believing God loves them, right? What's missing? The doctrine of adoption. And even if you've been rooted and grounded in justification, sanctification, glorification, even if you've been rooted and grounded in that and you never think about the doctrine of adoption, if you have the confession as your guide, you won't be able to get away from it. Right? You won't be able to escape it. It'll be right there, and you'll go, ah, I forgot this. Okay? See, when we're making disciples, that's just one example. So if I'm supposedly discipling someone, and I'm not using a guide, let alone a confession as a guide, I'm not using a guide, how many things like that am I going to skip over? How many things like that am I going to neglect in this process of discipleship? Discipling my children, raising my children. How many things are we going to neglect in raising our children? There are so many things when we're raising children that are just right there in our faces. Amen? Especially when you got nine of them. Just right there in your face. And you spend so much time just responding to the things that are right there in your face. If you don't have some kind of guide, the next thing you know, they're grown and gone. And there are dozens of things that you just never got to. Because of the tyranny of the urgent, right? How much more is that true with people that we don't have living with us for two decades? Where they just happen to be relations of ours at church for however long you're with us until we get moved along or they get moved along or whatever. How much more likely are we to just have serious gaps, right? Okay. But there are still a lot of people who have a problem with confessions. Listen to this from Sam Waldron in Modern Exposition. Sadly, we live in a non-credal, even an anti-credal age marked by existential relativism, anti-authoritarianism, and historical isolationism. Historical isolationism is the idea that all we know is our own period in history, right? This is the greatest time that there ever was. No time before ever mattered, no time after matters. Many professing Christians regard creeds and confessions as man-made traditions, the precepts of men, mere religious opinion. That's what, that's what people think. And we've got to deal with that. We've got to be aware of that. We've got to know where it comes from. One place it comes from is the idea of mysticism. Mysticism. Listen to this from Charles Hodge. A mystic is one who claims to see or know what is hidden from other men. Whether this knowledge be attained by immediate intuition or by inward revelation. In most cases, these methods were assumed to be identical as intuition was held to be the immediate vision of God and of divine things. Hence, the wide sense of the word mystic are those who claim to be under the immediate guidance of God or the Spirit. Do we know anybody like that? Is there anybody like that on television? How many Christians have been under the sway of this mysticism? Let's move forward and look at this from John Piper. It's not enough to say that God's revelation in Scripture comes to us in human language. It comes in the language of particular humans, in particular times and places. There are no distinctively divine uh, language conventions. That is, when God spake through men, he did not always use the same language or the same style or the same vocabulary. Rather, all the evidence points to the fact that God always availed himself 
of language and style and vocabulary and particular usages of individual biblical writers, even in the prophetic speech, speeches where God is directly quoted, there are language traits that distinguish one author from another. Quietism. What is quietism? See if you recognize this. The quietest Christian is one who doesn't make any decisions because the Holy Spirit makes them for us. Such a person is also likely to construct a docetic hermeneutic of scripture. The human characteristics of the biblical documents are ignored. Historical and biblical theological context are regarded as irrelevant. If a text speaks to me in whatever way, the careful exegesis of it is dismissed as intellectualism. I got a word from the Lord. And then we rip a scripture out of context. The word said to me, da 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 And then somebody who knows the Bible comes back and says, well, actually, what that text means is, ah, you're just trying to put God in a box. Anybody know that person? All right. Let's move forward. Why are confessions legitimate? Number one, they are useful means of public affirmation and defense of truth. A useful means of public affirmation and defense of truth. What do we believe? What do we mean? Our confessions are helpful in this regard. Um, I have met a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses since I've been here. I mean a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. And... I, I find it useful and helpful to go back through confessions and creeds, earliest documents in Christianity, basically demonstrating what you believe has been refuted by Christians since Christians began to refute heresy, right? That's important. That's important. Not everybody responds to that the same way, but it's important. Um, secondly, Confessions serve as public standards for fellowship and discipline. Public standard for fellowship and discipline. Someone sins. Who decides what a sin is? Well, the Bible decides what a sin is. Amen? We don't just get to all of a sudden invent new sins. We have a confessional framework. We have a standard. Right? Right? They serve as a concise standard by which to evaluate ministers of the word. How do we evaluate ministers of the word? Somebody stands up here and says something that is not in line with the truth, right? Someone else has a problem with it. What do we do? The one with the most education wins. The oldest one wins. The biggest one wins. The one who speaks the loudest wins. Or... Our confessional standard settles that. Amen? And confessions contribute to a sense of historical continuity. We are a part of something that we didn't just make up. We're a part of something that's been around since the Bible. All right. In the time that we have left, let's look at the outline of the confession but I want to put it in categories. First, the first six chapters of the confession give us a biblical foundation, or give us a theological foundation for a biblical worldview. A theological foundation for a biblical worldview. That's chapters one through six, okay? Chapter one of the Holy Scriptures. And chapter one is amazing. When chapter one is long, Right? Chapter 1 is long. To find a chapter that long, you got to go all the way to 26 on the church. I mean, chapter 1 is long. Um, but if you can get somebody to listen that, to that, or if you can just sort of pick pieces out of that. And, and as we go through this together, it's important to look at chapter 1 for a number of reasons. Because when people are opposed to the idea of confessions, one of the things we said was what? 
No confession but what? The Bible, right? Well, chapter one on our confession is on the Bible. And it's awesome. And the first thing that we do in our confession, because people believe that confessions are problematic because they undermine the Bible as the sole authority for faith and practice. I'm going, that's interesting. You believe that the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice? For all matters of faith and practice? Yes. What, what verse in the Bible says that? Huh? Well... Yeah, what do you mean verse? I mean, there, of course, there's no, no verse that says that. Wait a minute. Because almost all of the confessions say that. But there's not a verse that says that. Do, do you see? So what our confession does is our confession sort of collects those things that the that, that, that the Bible says about itself, right? And states that in ways that can be clarified and understood and agreed upon between us, all right? Um, at the end, we'll look at some of these because this is important and helpful. But that's where we start. We start with, what do we mean when we say scripture? Secondly, of God, the Holy Trinity, well, there we go again. That word's not in the Bible, right? But it is necessarily contained. By the way, that's a confessional statement. Things that are necessarily contained. Things that when you read the Bible, you see. Now, what we have to do when it comes to theology, the Bible brings us um, narrative, right? It brings us a narrative. It brings us letters, it brings us history, it brings us these prophetic statements. But the, the Bible, for the most part, is not just giving us theological constructs. There are some places where we have those. You read the book of Romans and he's giving you justification and sanctification. And we have these words there, right? But sometimes we need to have words in order to explain those things that the Bible just presents. Trinity is an example of that, or triune, the triune God is an example of that. We don't have that word in scripture, but in the English language, there's not a better one to describe what the Bible presents. Is that? This is yes. Okay. So what's the Bible? The Bible's where we know God. Okay, so we just determine that, number one. Number two, who's God? Because that's principally what the Bible is telling us, right? Number three, God's decree. Huge, huge chapter. And there's a reason that this is important. Let me give you another principle. This is a principle that I get from uh, Renahan. We have to read the confession horizontally as well as vertically. In other words, it's not just chapter one leads us to chapter two, leads us to chapter three. So let me give you an example. When somebody wants to talk about free will, chapter nine, you can either jump into a discussion about free will, which usually starts with our anthropology, or our doctrine of man, what we believe about man, right? And this person is going to say that they believe this about man, and they're gonna say that they believe this about God, right? God wouldn't do this, God wouldn't do that, God did this, God did this, so on and so forth, right? That's what happens when you start a discussion with someone about free will. But if you horizontally have to go first to God's decree, and then, Remember that by the time you get to free will, things change. Um, you know what? Do we have any copies of the confession? Did you, guys, did you guys bring your copies of the confession? I'm going to take that as a no. All right. <laughs> 
Let me read this on God's decree. Look at paragraph 1, chapter 3. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so, as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Well, if that's true, whenever I start talking about man's free will, I have to talk about it in the context of a worldview that understands God's decree, okay? And this is the problem that we run into when we try to talk about issues in isolation. This is also the problem we run into when we get a letter like the one that the brother sent. I'm, not, I'm in 95% agreement with your confession, except here, 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 right? Well, if you read the confession horizontally, each one of them, and I wrote him back, and I said, brother, thank you so much for your willingness, and so on and so forth, and I said, you know, basically, based on the objections that you have, he basically fell into one of two categories. Either a dispensationalist, right, who liked the language of the 1689, or New Covenant theology, which is very sinister and very popular, especially at the seminary that he came from. I said, based on your objections, you're more likely in the New Covenant camp, which is opposed to 1689 federalism and cannot fully subscribe to it. And ultimately, he just said, yeah, you're probably right. What if he'd come? What if he'd come? What if he'd start teaching in the theology department? Ah, it's just a little disagreement here. Ah, it's just a little disagreement there. And all of a sudden, you know, when you're reading the, 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 the confession horizontally, we've got somebody teaching in this area over here something that denies. Boom, 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 boom. It's hugely problematic. But when we don't think about the confession rightly, we don't get that. We just think it's a collection of statements, right? I like this one. I don't like that one. But you have to read it horizontally. This all works together. So, four of creation. Five, divine providence. Six, the fall of man, of sin, and the punishment thereof. Those are the foundations the theological foundations of a biblical worldview. And it's in the first six chapters of the confession. It's very important to understand that that's how those work. The second section, a biblical view of salvation for worldview thinking. That's chapter seven to 10. God's covenant, Christ the mediator, free will, effectual calling okay this 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 gives you the premise this gives you god's response to what we just saw in chapter six the fall of man sin the punishment thereof what is the answer to that how does that get fixed well god has a covenant he gives us a mediator that mediator has something to do with our free will, which actually is not free. And effectual calling, which is the only way that fallen man can be saved, right? Next, we get the order salutis. And that's in chapters 11 to 14. 11 to 14. Linked inexorably to those chapters that came before it and those chapters that come after it when we read the confession horizontally, right? All the way back to God's decree, all right? 
So when we read, for example, on justification, Chapter 11, paragraph 1. Those whom God effectually calls, he also freely justifies, not by infusing righteousness into them, as Rome would say, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and soul righteousness, they receiving and resting on them and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves. It is the gift of God. This is absolutely important in light of God's decree. Okay? Adoption, sanctification, saving faith, all right? These are all important parts of us understanding the order salutis that we've been prepared for in the section prior. Hold on. The next section, reform thought and the fruit of righteousness. Reform thought and the fruit of righteousness. Um, this is really about the Christian life. Okay? So if we've just looked at salvation, now we look at, at, at what that brings. First, we have chapter 20 of the gospel and the extent of the grace thereof. Chapter 20 is where we deviate from Westminster. Okay? This is a chapter that was added to the 1689 that is not in Westminster, all right? So if you're in, if you're past chapter 20, you're going to have offset chapter numbers when you're cross-referencing with Westminster if you're trying to see what the differences are, all right? The problem is Westminster doesn't have our chapter 20, okay? Of the gospel and the extent of the grace thereof, of Christian liberty and the liberty of conscience, this is a quintessential uh, Baptist doctrine, uh, extremely important, and not what people generally think. We think, you know, Christian liberty, liberty of conscience, I get to do what I want. Um, that, that chapter is not about that at all. Of religious worship and the Lord's Day. Um, chapter 22 is a huge problem for people who are Calvinistic but not Reformed. Uh, this is one of the areas where they have to get off, Okay. This is where they push the button, pull the cord, stop the train, right? Jump off of it, moving if they have to, okay? Um, this idea of religious worship in the Lord's Day, this idea that the fourth commandment um, still has any moral bearing on, on believers today. Um, this idea of the moral law as such, hugely problematic. And... If somebody has a problem with this, then I'm, usually I'm going, okay, you say you have a problem with that chapter. Don't you also have a problem with chapter 19? Because chapter 19 is on the law of God. And they kind of, well, yeah, actually, yeah, of course you do. Because one part of the confession is connected to another part of the confession. By the way, you also have a problem um, with chapter 7, God's covenant. And most of them completely miss that. And I've had the experience of talking to people who've said, well, yeah, I might have a problem with chapter 19. And I go, but also chapter 7. No, oh, no, no, I don't have a problem with chapter 7. We go back to chapter 7 and I start reading and they go, yeah, yeah, chapter 7. Yeah, problem with chapter 7. Because it's connected. Okay? We've got to keep this in mind. And as we're going through this, when we look at a particular chapter, try to figure out and connect it to those, those other chapters that matter, um, of lawful oaths and vows, um, 
and of marriage. Uh, that, that, that's important. We're talking about lawful oaths and vows and marriage. Um, there are a number of people, um, for example, who, who um, have a problem with marriage ceremonies. Um, this chapter on lawful oaths and vows. Um, by the way, an, an oath and a vow, there's two different things. An oath is, you know, raise your right hand, put your hand on the Bible, right? You're sworn in at, co at court. You saw him swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I don't know what you guys say here, but something, right? So help you God. I do, right? That's an oath, all right? Um, a, a, a vow is when you will ag agree to something by repeating after someone. A uh, marriage ceremony, by the way, is oath and vow, right? Oath and vow. It's do you, I do, and repeat after me. I, so-and-so-and-so, take you, so-and-so-and-so, to be my right, right? Oath and vow. Did we just make that up? Our confession has it right here and right before the chapter on marriage. Wow. Because what do you do in marriage? Take oaths and vows. Okay? And hey, yeah, there, there are those people who, yeah, we just know. We just, we declare ourselves married. <laughs> Not so much. All right. Um, chapters 26 through 30 gives us re reformed thought in the people of God. Reformed thought and the people of God. So this is how we live and how we respond to God's salvation in the previous chapters, in chapters 20 to 25. Um, now we see uh, what, what this does for us as the people of God. Chapter 26 of the church. Long chapter. Very important chapter. Uh, chapter 27, the communion of saints. Chapter 28, baptism and the Lord's Supper. 29, baptism. 30, Lord's Supper. Okay? Baptism and the Lord's Supper, the front door and the back door of the church. We come into the church. Baptism. Put out of the church. No Lord's Supper. Right? Barred from the table. Table fellowship. Lord's Supper, communion. This is, this is evidence of our continuing in faithfulness with the people of God, right? And it's the privileges removed from us should that evidence no longer be there. So those chapters. And then uh, reform thought and last things. Uh, chapter 31 of the state of man after death and the resurrection of the dead. And then chapter 32 of the last judgment. When we think about the confession in these categories, and there are a few other ways that people have put these together, um, but when we think about it in these categories, when we recognize that the confession is sort of moving like this and covering things in this way, it helps us to look at the confession, like I said, horizontally and how all of these things fit together, all right? How you can't have a problem with the Lord's Day and the Sabbath without having a problem with chapter 19 and chapter 7. You, you, you just, you can't do it, all right? You disagree with chapter 7, you disagree with chapter 19, that's why you can't accept, right, the chapter on... Uh, religious worship in the Lord's Day. Um, all right. For the sake of time, that's all I'm going to cover tonight. We have a couple questions. Chapter 1, paragraph 1. The Holy Scriptures is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will which is necessary unto salvation. 
Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and at diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church. And afterward, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and of the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same wholly unto writing which maketh the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God revealing his will unto people being now ceased. That's the heart of Word of Faith theology. That's a dagger right through its heart because it's based on continued revelation, secret knowledge, right? It's a dagger through the heart. Here's the other issue. The confession was not written to address issues. The confession was written to give a concise account of what we believe are the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Now because of that, the confession touches on everything that would be essential, right? Um, now having said that, it doesn't mean that we can't then extrapolate from that um, and, and, and make statements about certain things like that could be a jumping off point right as a statement for the health and wealth and prosperity gospel um, but also the chapter on providence the chapter on god's decree um, the health and wealth prosperity gospel and this is the thing that amazed me teaching through the confession as many times as i did right is obviously you see where there are things that are pointed at the Pado Baptist, a lot of things that are pointed at Rome, so on and so forth. But there are so many times in the confession you read this and it's like they anticipated these modern movements. Why? Because there's nothing new under the sun. This is not the first time we've seen a version of the health and wealth and prosperity gospel, right? It's a form of Gnosticism. It's been dealt with for a long time. So what this does is it deals with the theological basis upon which these heresies is built. And that's what's important. We can then extrapolate and state other things, right? But be because there's nothing new under the, none of these heresies is new. They're addressed S many times over, many times over. Yeah. 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 So the 1689 is not the scriptures, right? The 1689 is not the scriptures. In fact. The first chapter is about the scriptures. Now, the confession and I would take issue with the idea that God is revealing new things to men today, right? Because chapter 1, paragraph 1, these former ways of God's revealing his will to his people now having been ceased, right? We don't have that. Um, so we, we wouldn't operate on that basis. Um, however, and this is the difference between us, for example, and Presbyterians. So our Presbyterian brethren around the world, because they have um, a, a Presbyterian form of government or our Anglican brethren, because they have an Episcopal form of government, they have structures, superstructures above the local church. So those superstructures can add to their confessions, right? Baptists are congregational. We don't have superstructures above the local church that have authority over the local church. So you might have a group of Baptists who make a statement about a certain theological issue in their context, in their area, but the idea that Baptists on the whole would do that would actually not fit. This is why you have, for example, the Philadelphia Confession, the New Hampshire Confession, because, you know, then in the United States, you've got groups of Baptists adopting this, right, and trying to suit it to their environment. So the Confession is not infallible. The Scripture, that's what's infallible. But at the same time, we do not have God giving Scripture-level revelation to men after the scripture. So, yeah. yeah, the question is, can things, can things be edited out, edited out of the confession? And the two examples that you use um, are the most common ones. Um, 
the one about the Pope being the Antichrist. That's an instance where we have to make sure we're not reading 17th century Baptists through the eyes of 21st century Baptists. They're not writing that like the Left Behind series. They're not saying that the Pope is the Antichrist in the sense of we're looking for Nikolai Carpathia and the, you know what I mean? They're not dispensationalists like that. That's not what they mean. But when you look at the definition of Antichrist, especially when you look at the fact that the scripture is always plural, there is no person on earth who better fits that description than whoever holds the office of the Pope. Because he puts himself up as alter Christus or another Christ. So we have to make sure that we're not reading left behind into the confession as though the, the guys are writing the confession trying to say, you know, as we look at, you know, look for Nikolai Carpathia or, you know, the seven years of tribulation. And say, ah, I think that guy, that's not what they were saying. They're talking about this office and what it means to be antichrist, right? Um, the other thing is the statement about elect infants dying in infancy. infancy. Um, there's nothing wrong with the statement. It didn't need to be in there, right? But there's nothing wrong with the statement. Um, it doesn't even address the other side of the equation. Um, so, yeah, there, there, there are things like that that are especially uncomfortable to us when we're not used to reading 17th century Baptist, right? But when we read it in light of um, and through the eyes of 17th century Baptist, they're far less problematic than they seem at first blush, you know? Yeah. And by the way, those were my two main objections when I first was introduced to the confession. I'm like, man, this is awesome. Why'd they have to say that, you know? Um, but again, the more I've gone through this and the more I've learned about the 17th century Baptist and their context and, you know, and, and about my own things, you know, reading back into it. Um, yeah, cause all of us, when we hear the term antichrist, we're thinking about the dispensationalist and the rapture and the, you know, the, the that's not, that's not what 17th century Baptists were talking about. All right, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for those who have gone on before us, for those whose, whose work has blessed and benefited us greatly. Thank you for footsteps to follow, for giants on whose shoulders we can stand. Grant by your grace that we might never neglect or take this privilege for granted, nor put too much stock in it. For even the authors of our confession made it very clear that yours is the final word. Thank you for the ways in which our confession of faith magnify your word, magnify Christ, magnify your work in saving your people. Grant that it might motivate us to proper, heartfelt, biblical, passionate, unceasing worship. For we pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.